Hello, hello. I am Ben Pick. And thank you for joining me in Running to Write, where I give questionable writing advice through running metaphors. Who's ready to listen to my tips on writing about hearing? I don't really have too many good puns, so I'll just move things along quickly. Let's start by closing your eyes and imagining the room that you're in, the room that you're listening or watching me from. With your eyes closed, the next sense you likely jump to is hearing. Think about all the types of sounds that can be used to describe where you are. Right now, I'm in the basement, so things are pretty quiet. But uh, as of like two minutes ago, uh, they were getting pretty noisy. So right above me, my dog was um, chewing chewing on like a chew toy, and he was grinding it into the floor. So like every single bite he took, I could actually hear when I was doing pre-show prep. And I went upstairs to just make sure everything was all right. He was just chewing on a bone, but it was really, really loud coming through the floor. And then, of course, once um, once we get started, Adriana started uh, cooking, working on dinner. And so because she's working on dinner, he runs upstairs because he's afraid of anybody being in the kitchen. So we had the whole, you know, pitter patter, patter, patter up the stairs. And there were a lot of sounds in the room I'm in. But maybe you're in a permanently quiet room or you're watching me in, I don't know, a Starbucks or jump to a concert or a crowded restaurant. Think about how you would describe something in an overwhelming environment where conversations, music, and hypothetically, but not hypothetically, a crying baby drowned out the words of someone sitting across from you or more specifically me. Going back to the me for a minute, the entire series, this entire series about the five senses started on a date with my wife, Adriana. And that was the basis for this entire series because we were inundated with smells, with taste, with, um, you know, uh, well, yeah, sure. Touch in the restaurant, but, you know, let's let's keep it classy here. So there's a whole bunch of other things. But more importantly, there was a lot of sounds and sights that were just hitting us from all sides. And I struggled to listen to what she was saying, even though she was you know, maybe two or three feet away from me. We basically had to shout the entire time because it was just so much commotion going on around us. It was also the first time I think a waiter ever apologized to us or me or us or whatever for having a crying baby sitting at the table next to us. The apology wasn't necessary, but the crying baby did make the conversation I was trying to have a lot more difficult. And another thing I want to introduce with this episode, and I'll continue it through with sight, is to consider readers who may be impaired. Unlike with taste, smell, or touch, where that didn't necessarily apply, in general, we can all use those senses to some degree, even if they degrade as we age, or if they vary by person, you know, some people might have stronger sense of touch or taste or smell, or they can, um, was it sommeliers who can distinguish the various ingredients in, in a wine that I obviously can't really do. I can just say, you know, yes, this smells, fruity, this smells like oak, this smells, you know, this, that, and the other, but they can distinguish down to the grape, the grape um, vineyard that was used or something along those lines. And yeah, sure, some of that is kind of made up and BS, but at the same time, their sense of smell is obviously much stronger than mine and their ability to distinguish, distinguish various pieces of, uh, of the components within the, whatever we're drinking is much superior to my own. But all that to say that we still, you know, I can still smell and touch and taste wine much like even an expert would. However, hearing is an instance where a significant portion of readers may be potentially impaired in a way that they don't experience that sense at all. And with that in mind, we need to consider readers in ways which we didn't really have to for the first three episodes of the series where I talked about like I keep mentioning, taste, smell, or touch. So these are my five tips to writing sounds into our story. And before we get things underway, I do want to just check out the chat because I want to thank all of you for being here. So let's see here. So Felicia, I think you were the first person in. Thank you so much for joining us. Richard, awesome to be here. And uh, apparently you can't hear me, but this was before the show. So, you know, that makes sense. We were also talking about how Adriana is making pork bellies at the moment, and they are delicious. It's basically just double fried bacon, and it is more than that, but it is it is fantastic. And I approve. 
My mouth is still on fire because I had a few of them before pre-show and I got my water right here. So if I start choking up, there's there's some spicy sensations going on in my mouth. And uh, I guess two weeks ago was when I talked about taste. So, well, we got that. So, Paul with Andy, thank you for coming on. And cool gamer. Awesome that you're here. You also have Jordan Mahoney, The Blind World. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, no worries. You know, if you haven't been here a while, nothing wrong with that. But we all appreciate you being here tonight. So it's cool that you were able to join us. It's cool that you were able to join us. And sorry, I'm, I'm reading Richard's thing. You know, no, no, no. I don't think that there should be any discount on a bill because there's a crying baby nearby. To some extent, I guess if there's one kid, it's fine. You know, you have one one kid, obviously. You, like, you, you want the parents to go out. I want people to go out, have fun, enjoy themselves. But if it's like multiple crying kids, that's, uh, I feel like that's kind of on the parents and, you know, they should, whatever. But I also think that like the people who were there were regulars and or knew the owners of the restaurant. So they definitely got some some nice uh, treats throughout the night or the, the cook came over and a whole bunch of people sort of paraded through. And uh, I was about to say something. Oh, and they even though it was just my wife and I, we were served much, much slower than the table next to us because I think they already knew what they wanted. And it's a, it's a whole thing. But either way, I definitely had a lovely night and I enjoyed it. Oh, boy. Yeah, so there's some discussion about... I'm not a spice wuss, but there is still some some kick to it. And that makes you know my throat not really... It makes it difficult to talk after eating something really spicy. And they aren't that spicy. They're, they're, they're fine. But it does... When I'm trying to have a conversation and it's nonstop talking, 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 it does make it more difficult having just eaten spicy foods as opposed to not doing that. And moving right along, number one for hearing, supplement actions and reactions. Sounds convey motions or more subtly, decisions. Explosions, car engines zooming by, a hawk screeching before it dives on its prey. All those are actions we can clearly see or see the results of that get enhanced with sound. Over the explosion, we can tell the distance based on the difference between explosion itself of seeing the explosion and hearing the explosion it's the same with lightning and yes i've been had a few close calls when i was out running during a thunderstorm i think the closest strike might have been about 200 feet away and it was a near instantaneous boom of course that was obviously a great shock because it was so loud and you know the flash of light kind of did it too and it's not really great because I was probably the largest object, tallest object nearby, with the exception of some trees. And you don't really want to hide under trees during a lightning storm. So I just kind of uh, kept running and hoped I would get home without being hit by lightning. Anyways, the hawk screech might preface a dive for prey or it might simply be warning other birds to stay away. The car engine can be both. It can preface somebody driving by or somebody driving through the neighborhood. And it can also warn me that someone is approaching, specifically someone who is a giant tool. I'll just say that outright. Uh, even after they've driven half a mile away, I can still sort of hear them, hear the sounds of their engine just echoing all across the neighborhood. Now, I'm very biased here. But in fact, a few years before I moved into the house I'm at, there was a severe issue with street racing, basically... Uh, one street over, and that ended in a lot of car crashes because there are stop signs there that, you know, sure, it's, it's bad enough when people ignore those anyways, but to have somebody driving through those, it's a residential neighborhood, so there were a lot of collateral damages and uh, compensation via showing off via vehicles. So, Luckily, since I've been here, there hasn't been any drag racing or anything like that. Now I only need to worry about people running red lights. And again, I'm absolutely biased here. I I watched an uh, I was walking Rufus, almost watched a crash happen because somebody who didn't have the right way turned left in front of an oncoming um, cars. So the light turned green. They just kind of gunned it and hoped for the best. And uh, people going straight just had to obviously stop, even though they had the right of way. And just honk their horns. So, you know, 
obey traffic laws, people. But like the bright, like the brightness on, say, a poisonous frog's back, a loud engine revving, tells me I want nothing to do with the driver as a person. So action and reaction based on sound. In stories, though, it could convey somebody you want to try making them seem out to be cool. Or you could be like me and write them a, as a character who is trying way, way too hard. Depends on how you want to go through it. But either way, that is a, well, that is certainly a character trait to have somebody who drives a loud car or somebody who is by far the loudest amongst a group of friends. Something along those lines is very easy to have both an action that leads to a reaction based on sound. Number two, convey voices. If I pick up the phone without looking at it, I can tell who's calling me based on the first word, mostly because the pool of potential people calling me is very minuscule. Even my wife, she doesn't really call me because texting is so much easier. That's the way it works. Even with family, texting is obviously easier. If somebody calls me, I know it's either somebody's trying to get a hold of me or they're driving. And aside from that, my auditory senses allow me to recognize someone's voice or recognize that they're a stranger and then hang up. But the, even though the audio signal within a cell phone kind of distorts a person's voice, I still can recognize my grandmother or one of my friends. And traveling back in time, a few decades, the same is true when I was growing up. Even before caller ID, I could tell the difference from one word of green between my friends. That's how I could distinguish a yo from one of my friends who lived in my street versus a hey from the guy who lived a couple of streets over. And I could instantly tell between the two of them who was trying to get a hold of me. They used different green words, but the pitch, the volume, and the length they held it were all tells to indicate which friend was trying to call me and get together, see what was going on, or go see a movie or whatever. And maybe we don't need more, maybe we don't need to be more descriptive than that than to use, say, gruff tones or frightened squeak when describing someone's voice. There is a balance to giving our characters distinct voices, just like purple prose, between giving really minute and specific details that last far longer than they need to, or just carrying over in one or two words and then just moving on. If you can, try to convey each voice as unique. We already aim to make what the person says be unique. So why not try for the sounds coming out of their mouths itself? So why not try for the sounds coming out of their mouths? I do work considerably to ensure that only one character would say one specific thing rather than another. And my alpha reader does point out to me when I get it wrong. And there's a large cast of people in the stories I write. There's this, it's an ensemble cast. And so I try to, among the group of friends, there are similar interests and similar traits. That's part of what ties them all together. But I also like that there are differences. And so when one person says something, I try to make it specific so that only they will be the ones to say it because it fits better with their personality, interest, or general world views. <laughs> uh, no, it's not quite the font. Oh, I, I guess it is a little bit of the fonts. But yeah, my friends are... No, special is uh, they 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 were well we were all idiots back then so I'll, I'll just say that and yeah oh wow um Jordan yeah you have to use your sense of hearing more to compensate for lack of patience <laughs> oh sorry I shouldn't have laughed at the end of that um for your lack of sight since I'm visually impaired I'm sorry um I was laughing at the lack of patience using you know you have to use your set, hearing more to deal with the lack of patience but I, I I'm sorry for laughing at the second part of that um. Because, yeah, you, well, not you, but the collective we. Um, there are definitely people I know who test other people's senses, whether that is through aggressive touching via, you know, punching somebody when you see them, like a friendly just punch in the shoulder, or, um, you know, general just being obnoxious. So, yes, there are definitely people out there, friends of mine who test patients and especially friends of friends. Um, there's a reason why I'm not friends with everybody in the larger group of friends, but that's neither here nor there.
Hmm. I exclusively tell people to eat stuff. No, that works. All right. Number three, sounds are settings. Sorry, number three, sounds are setting. Imagine being dropped from wherever you are and watching this from a jungle or a busy city or an open flatland. Sounds will tell us where we are. Describing what we see in greed. Describing what we see is great and all, but including the sounds pulls us deeper into the world of our books. Like surround sound when we're watching a movie where the, especially in a movie theater where it's much more encompassing when the lights are dimmed down to nothing and all we have is a screen in front of us and the booming stereos from either side. It makes us feel like we're more involved in watching a movie. Or you could go 4D where, you know, the seat moves and if it's rainy, you get sprayed in the face with water and this, then the other thing and it tries to like move in time with, with what the characters are doing and it shakes and it, it's a whole thing. But all that is to try and make us experience the movie in different ways, whether that is make us experience the movie as the people, the actors are experiencing it or as the characters they're portraying are experiencing it or not. And we want to bring the movie th theater sensations into our living room couches by adding sound to our stories. Chirping insects, croaking frogs, a steady patter of rain off leaves tells us the characters are in a jungle versus a city. Or they're in a tiny shred of a park somewhere within a city. Either way, the sounds a character hears augment the sights to give a richer sense of the setting. Number four, danger. Sound is also a means of warning us that danger is nearby or to tell us when we're safe or to, as I'll get to in a second, deceptively tell us that we're safe when it is in fact very dangerous to be there. Creaking floorboards indicate that someone's right behind us. And I don't know if this is a rumor or not, but I feel like I've heard enough times that might be true where ancient Japanese homes had floorboards that intentionally creaked to indicate you know if somebody's trying to sneak in or do whatever and that was why they purposely creak um my house it's older so the floors i know the floorboards which do creak or you could go to uh, a quiet place where you had the exact steps that you needed to take when moving through the house marked out on the floor because otherwise if you make too much noise you'll attract the monsters and they'll come and kill everyone meaning that the sound was both dangerous and generating noise, and it was a way to stay safe. Silence is a sound too, so be sure to include that in your stories. A sudden hush of animals is an indication it's probably too late to avoid being pounced on by a leopard in the trees. But silence can also be good. I like writing when it's silent around me. It's also awkward in conversation. I've described multiple silences between characters as some degree of uncomfortable when they don't know what to say and nothing passes between their lips for a long period within that scene. Now, it's obviously not held quite so long in the book. You have a lot of character thoughts that sort of convey and, and carry it from one moment to the next. But in between those character thoughts, you know, maybe a couple of minutes have passed, maybe a minute has passed by without anybody saying anything. And so you want to try and build up that awkwardness. Speaking about not knowing else what to say, let's move on to the last point. Number five, practice. I started a night off by trying to get you to imagine the place you're currently in. When you go visit a location to use in our books, or when we go to visit vacation uh, location to use in our books or are imagining it, try the same technique. Close your eyes. I do the same. And instead of thinking about what the scene looks like, try to picture what you would hear at various times of the day. In the morning, the park might be filled with footsteps of people walking by, commuting to work, doing whatever, going on an early run. Then it might be silent and empty until the afternoon because nobody's in the park during the day. And in the afternoon, kids and dog walkers wander through. So it gets loud again and you hear people 
jumping on the 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 jungle gym and going through the slide and there's dogs barking and there's all kinds of other noises taking place. Lastly, at night, it becomes a cacophony of animal sounds from chirping insects to hooting owls to those croaking frogs they love to uh, comment on. The point is to make it robust so that it feels real instead of like talking head syndrome, but in reverse, where talking head syndrome is basically two characters in a blank room with no descriptions and they're just having a conversation. So that is nothing but sound. Well, the opposite is equally as distracting where you have something described out fully so you know what the characters look like, you know what they're doing, that they're you know eating lunch, you know what their food tastes like, and you know this and the other. But if you're in a mall versus in a park or somewhere else, the sound should be completely different. You can have people walking by and their footsteps sound different on grass versus concrete versus linoleum. You might have floor... Um, you might have sneakers that squeak as somebody trips or somebody just stumbles because the, you know, the linoleum was, um, I guess, washed too, too much or something along those lines. I don't know. It's your story. We can make it up as we go. But anyways, those are my five tips to bringing the auditory into our stories. But I'm not done yet. I want us to, I want to close out with something that's not quite a full tip. But something to think about, where we want to think about the music and cadence of our stories. It's not the sounds that are happening in the story, but rather how our stories sound. In other words, read our novels out loud. If we stumble over the words or our sounds grate our ears or it just doesn't sound right that might be our brain's way of telling us that the page long run-on sentence i have just thrown out into the world needs to be broken up into manageable bite-sized pieces otherwise it's a struggle to read through and with that i am ben pick thank you for joining me in running to write let me know in those comments how you write about what characters here i post my running and writing progress on x and more i post an instagram i sometimes post an x but instagram is where you mostly uh, most likely find me where i got my running updates i got channel updates i got all types of writing updates so be sure to follow along and join in on the fun also throw out your own comments in there too if you want there's also the running to write monthly newsletter if you want to sign up for that description is in the the link is in the description below and it's all about regular updates on Sort of musings, pitfalls, lessons learned, pictures of dogs. Rufus is making quite a Rufus has his own section now. So if you want to get updates about him, pictures, whatever, it's all good. And I'm planning to do a big one for next month, which will be the wrap up of 2023 and kind of review my writing. So if you want to sign up for the newsletter, if that's cool. If not, I will see you all next week. It's going to be all about sight, which will be the last of the five senses. And then I'm going to bring it all together on New Year's Day. That's the first. That's a Monday. I think I have my math right. Assuming that's a Monday, assuming it's the first, two weeks from now, I will be doing a big wrap up where I bring this all together. So hopefully I'll see you there. I might be at a different time because I have the day off so I can go at any time. If I don't go at seven, I'll likely go around noon just because that's most convenient, noon Eastern time. So I hope to see you there and I will post in all the places as I am, if I'm changing, if I'm changing my starting time. And if you like pictures of dogs, I have all, I talk about all my different dogs in next week's episode. So, well, you get to see what. Nick, Frank, George, and obviously Rufus, you've seen plenty of photos of, but you get to see what Nick, Frank, and George all look like. They're the dogs I took care of when I was growing up. They are no longer with us, but I still love them all the same. And with that, I will see you next time. Until then, listen to the world.